And so part of the well, so part of the design of this is to, in in a way, there's been just tremendous energy around urban agriculture for the past 15 years, and there's 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 the ambitions of folks like Walt all over the country, but there has yet to be a sort of you know. So our job as a land grant is to deal with agriculture, and and we've dealt with it a little bit, but we've dealt with it in this mode of of not bringing our best mind to the problem, right? And the problem wasn't a problem of encouraging people to be excited about agriculture, which seems to have been the approach for 15 years. The problem is a problem of, of agriculture itself and marketing and, and how you run a business in that way. And so urban agriculture promised for 15 years will deliver food and wealth to food insecure places. And what it's done is it's built a lot of gardens and a lot of ambition but it's also unfortunately created a lot of failures because if a single grower in an urban setting is trying to compete for the market and do the education with the kids and provide free vegetables and a space for, for, for reprieve, they, they can't do it. You can't expect a single grower to do that. And so just like over in the other economy, we divide labor, <laughs> this is what we've done in this urban ag economy. So we've got to do reasonable divisions of labor. Farmers should be farming. They should be focusing on farming. And the only way you get farmers to focus on farming is someone else does their marketing for them. And then these farmers, so our best partner is in this space, this urban farm space, um, which is a 12-acre brownfield, but a community partner there, they want to grow the vegetables to pay for their site, but they also want to do education. They want to provide urban ag certification. We're in conversations with ATI to have CCP offered in the summertime and pathways into an associate's degree there or even into Ohio State itself. And so we've created a space that is urban and run by a community organization but catalyzes all the expertise of Ohio State in order to help that community in multiple ways. But the base of this whole thing goes back to the microfarming system. If urban agriculture doesn't deliver dollars to its growers, it ain't going to survive because the foundations are going to stop paying for urban agriculture, just like they stop paying for, you know, we go through these fashions of funding, and when they go out of fashion, you can't get charitable dollars any longer. And I've been in the environmental space for 30 years. I've watched it happen multiple times. If you don't leave behind a robust, self-sustaining system when the charitable dollars run out so does all the good will and the good ideas and what I'd like to do is leave behind an urban agriculture that outlives the kind of charitable attention to this space and that delivers the promise that urban agriculture has had the third of an acre is the magic size right now really we're talking about small farms and small farming and this is why it works for the rural growers right. too Right, And we're learning on this site that really we might bring some households down to just a high tunnel on this site because that additional 17,000 makes all the difference in the world, but they can't afford the risk of running a whole like a farm over here. So we're learning in this space that we can right size this in a number of different ways with the same goal, which is capture food dollars that we're leaving Ohio in order to put wealth in places where wealth is needed. Yeah, wow. This is ideally, ideally. So yeah, so you came alone and you had the passion for growing, the passion for farming, and you wanted to get involved, and you had things set up in a way that you know you you could uh, just like the Stanfields, like the, the the family that we talked about. That's in the urban community. They had a passion for growing. They had put together some land and some property and some area to try to uh, to try to go about that passion. Then we could go about possibly through coming on the system and training and everything else. We could go about the process of you becoming a farmer, and you don't have to take on this big huge operation yourself, you can do what's manageable for you within the parameters of what you agree with the cooperative for your marketing agreement and things like that and then you can become a farmer. If there's none of us were farming no. uh, on our own. Uh, we had some we had somebody kind of working on the farm, yep. somebody uh, people were growing and stuff like that, but nobody was independently already in the process of farming before we created our cooperative. So everybody has different backgrounds, everybody works different jobs and things and so on. Nobody's farming uh, full time only um, as part of the, as, as the micro farm. So it's not expected to take over uh, the complete income for a household or anything like that, as much as it is allowing you to be a part of a business and bring an additional income um, to your household and to your business and to your life yeah. as well. 
and we hope we, we, we've got some hope so so fulfillment farms which is on the urban farm this guy's a great farmer he'd like to make two micro farms and we think he could do it and that then starts to talk about it becoming a full-time right. job that, that provides all of the household income we love that um, what we're what we the reason for the micro farm again is because you need an anchor scale right so the micro farm is designed to be that thirty to thirty five thousand dollars a year supplemental for a household and that's sufficient to make all the difference in the world for a household that's fallen below an income no, that's level. a pretty decent it's supplemental a, income a decent, and if you're a college graduate who's starting that you're starting out really well right with some capacity to grow and as a as an entrepreneur because this is rooted in running your own business uh, but it may be and we've been talking about this that three families feel like they'd rather divide that 30000 because 10 each is fine and that's all they can put into it. So three families can own a micro farm, yeah. right? And we're, that's, we're in the process yeah. of kind of figure out like where is all of those right size overlaps with this money. But without the micro farm as the baseline, then you're just shooting in the dark at, at, at nothing. So it's our target point around which we go, how does this now deliver what we want to deliver, which is wealth in places where wealth is needed. Yeah, and, and ideally, by having people come together, you know, you're dividing those responsibilities, yeah. you're dividing those costs and things. You don't have to sacrifice, you know, your whole life and your experience and what you've been doing to start farming or to start getting involved in community work or agriculture or things like that. It's, it's kind of, you know, kind of trying to find, like Kip's trying to say, that, that, that balance of, of what's comfortable for getting people involved without, uh, without you having to take on, you know, 10 acres and buying the John Deere and doing all this stuff, you know, yourself to kind of even think about being able to be make to make it into business, right? You know, that's kind of the thing, you know, if, even if you want to start growing on your own and you want to start doing a little project at your house and you spent the money to get high tunnels and build beds and things like that, you got to worry about so much um, as a small independent business um, to try to be successful with that, you know, all coming together and you doing your part of what you want to do and what's comfortable for you and what you're able to agree to do. Um, as part of the marketing with the cooperative, then you can still be successful. You don't have to take on all that yourself.